Okay, welcome everybody. I want to welcome you guys to our third lesson in our series of lessons on shock. In this lesson, we're going to be talking about hypovolemic shock. And my name is Eddie Watson, and I'm going to be your presenter for this series of lessons. And as always, in order to stay up to date on our lessons as we release them, uh, make sure and subscribe to our channel below. And don't forget to hit that bell icon, though, in order to be notified when new lessons become available. All right, so this is our first lesson in which we take a deep dive into each of the different types or causes of shock. And so to start off, if we talk about hypovolemic shock, I think it's really helpful if we break down the word hypovolemic and what it actually means. So it really breaks down into three parts. The first part being hypo, the next part being vol, and the last part being emic. And so basically each of these parts, hypo means low, vol is going to be for volume, and emic essentially comes from the Latin root for blood. And so really what this means is hypovolemic shock means that we have low blood volume. And so if we were to rewrite this in order to leave it up on the screen, basically what we're saying is that we have a reduced volume of blood. in your blood vessels. And in the case of hypovolemic shock, there are multiple causes or reasons in which you could have a reduced volume of blood in there. And so we're going to go ahead and talk about some of those now. So the first and probably most common and maybe even the most obvious cause of hypovolemic shock would be our external blood loss. And this is almost exclusively caused by some sort of trauma or injury. And that ultimately leads to an acute hemorrhage and thus hypovolemic shock. You can also see things like bleeding fistula sites or, or other sorts of causes, but the most common is typically trauma. So for our next set of causes, we classify these in what we call our internal sources of bleeding or our internal blood loss. And there can really be multiple causes for this internal blood loss. Some of the more common ones would be like our ruptured blood vessels. Ectopic pregnancies can cause this. Pancreatitis can as well. And finally, even though it's probably technically considered an external source of bleeding, we also have our GI bleeds. And those GI bleeds are often going to be found both our upper as well as our lower GI bleeds. Now for our third and final category for our causes of hypovolemic shock, we actually have a quite encompassing category that we're going to call fluid loss. So the first one we're going to talk about here is major burns. And this is not going to be just fire. This can also be caused by electrical burns as well. But whatever the cause, they can contribute to significant fluid loss and thus hypovolemic shock. Another cause of fluid loss could be emesis or vomiting. Could also see fluid loss as a result of excessive diarrhea. Also, if someone were to become too dehydrated, you could also see fluid loss from that. Another cause of fluid loss could also be something like ascites. And essentially this is a result of decreased albumin due to some sort of liver failure, which albumin plays a very important role in keeping fluid within the intravascular volume. And thus the decreased albumin can lead to third spacing of the fluids in places such as the abdomen. And finally, the last potential cause of fluid loss that we're going to talk about is going to be excessive use of diuretics. Now this isn't an all-inclusive list of all the causes of hypovolemic shock, but essentially these three main categories, the external blood loss, the internal blood loss, and the fluid loss, are going to compose all of the different causes that could lead to this state. 
So now next we're going to talk a little bit about the pathophysiology behind what's happening leading to the state of shock. And so we're going to go ahead and sort of list all that out down here. And this is going to be just a quick run through through the process, but if you really want to deep dive into some of these foundational concepts, you should watch our video on cardiac output within our hemodynamics lessons, which I'm going to go ahead and link to up above. All right, so the first thing that's going on is like we talked about, you're going to have a low blood volume. And what this is going to mean is that you're going to end up with a decreased preload. And so again, preload is that filling pressure going into the heart. So if you think about the fact that we have a decreased volume, therefore we have a decreased amount of blood that's making its way back to the heart before it contracts, you're therefore going to have a decreased preload. So if we just take a quick look at the cardiac output calculation, we know we have the cardiac output is equal to heart rate times our stroke volume. And therefore, if you have a decreased preload, you're going to have a decreased stroke volume, which is ultimately going to lead to a decreased cardiac output. And this ultimately is going to lead to one of our body's compensation mechanisms, which is increasing our heart rate. So really you can see here by having that decreased volume, you're not going to get enough blood back to the heart, also known as preload. And therefore that decreased preload is going to result in a decreased stroke volume and ultimately a decreased cardiac output. And this is essentially the driving force behind the shock state because now with that decreased cardiac output, we're not able to provide that perfusion that the body needs. So the last thing that I want to look at here is our mean arterial pressure calculation. So essentially our MAP is equal to our cardiac output times our systemic vascular resistance. And so again, as we just talked about, we now have a decreased cardiac output. And so the body is going to want to compensate by increasing our systemic vascular resistance in order to raise that mean arterial pressure, hopefully to try to provide enough perfusion to meet the body's needs. And so really what's happening here is the body is increasing that vascular squeeze, which is mostly happening within the venous system. And this is working to aid in returning that blood back to the heart to increase that preload. And if you think about within our previous lesson, this is going to be that sympathetic response. And so now let's move on and talk about some of the signs that you're going to see in a patient who is in hypovolemic shock. So first and most obvious is going to be our decreased blood pressure or hypotension. And so as we talked about, as the body begins to try and compensate, we're going to see that increased heart rate or tachycardia. And then also as the body's working to try to increase that SVR and it's clamping down those blood vessels, we're going to see that peripheral vasoconstriction. And so you're going to see that cool, clammy skin. And in addition to this, you could also see pale skin in your patient. And this is going to be most notable in a patient who's having some sort of blood loss. And just a couple lab tests that you would want to be looking at and assessing in a patient with hypovolemic shock. You'd want to be checking a lactate or lactic acid. Again, checking to see if our patient has switched into that anaerobic process. You're also going to want to check a complete blood count or a CBC, checking and seeing if your patient's blood levels have dropped. And also you're going to check an arterial blood gas or an ABG. And here essentially you're going to be looking to assess that oxygenation. And for the last part of this lesson, we're going to talk about some of the treatments that you're going to want to do for a patient in hypovolemic shock. So there's really just a couple main things that you want to do. First, you want to either stop the bleeding or the fluid loss. So whether it's that external or internal bleeding or one of the major types of fluid loss. And if you can and you're able to, you're going to need to stop that fluid loss in order to stop the progression of the shock state. Because if we put our interventions in place and continue to support the shock state, but we haven't corrected that cause, ultimately we're not going to be fixing the problem. And so this is probably the most important of these. So next, we're going to be looking at replacing the volume. And for this, we refer to this as a like-for-like -like process. So oftentimes, we'll start off with our IV fluids, and this is typically our isotonic fluids. But in that like-for-like -like fashion, 
if the patient is bleeding, you're going to want to give them blood. You're also going to be looking at giving them fresh frozen plasma or FFP, as well as other various types of blood products or clotting factors. You also, depending on the cause and what's going on, could be looking at giving your patient albumin or Hespan, either to replace the albumin or to act as a volume increaser. And really the last thing that we're going to look to do is to support the patient's blood pressure. And for this, really we're talking about the use of pressors. So this is going to be our Levo, Neo, Vaso, other forms of, of pressors that are out there that are working to increase blood pressure. All right, and so that is pretty much our review of hypovolemic shock. As we talked about, it's really that reduced volume of blood that's available to the body. And so we talked about some of those causes that could be leading to that, that state of hypovolemic shock, as well as the pathophysiology behind what's going on and why we're in a shock state as a result of that. And so really this path, pathophysiology and those signs that you would see, this is where you're going to start to see some of those telltale signs that this is hypovolemic shock. You're going to see that low blood pressure, increased heart rate, and that increased systemic vascular resistance, which is a classic sign of hypovolemic shock. And in a future lesson, after we do a deep dive in all the different types of shock, we're going to summarize everything at the end and look at ways in which we can really distinguish between what type of shock your patient is in. And that led into talking about some of the signs that you would see uh, in your patient that's in shock, as well as some of the labs that you'd want to check. And so with that said, that concludes this lesson. I do want to thank you for watching today, and I really hope this lesson was informative for you. And if you liked this video and you did find it useful, make sure and hit that like button below as it really helps to get the word out about our channel. And in the comments below, tell us your favorite part of this video, or certainly feel free to ask any questions that you might have. Finally, make sure and check out our next lesson in this series covering cardiogenic shock. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.